Hello and welcome back to World War II TV and Medics Week. And this, I believe, is going to be the most personal of the shows we do this week because it's essentially about two people who got caught up in the rather incredible Battle of Attu, which is one of the battles I didn't know a huge amount about until I read our my guest's uh, book. Uh, my guest's fantastic book, I should say. I'll hold it up now. Storm of Our Shores, and our guest tonight is Mark Masik, who is a journalist and writer from Denver, Colorado, who joins me now. So um, um, it's morning for you. So good morning, Mark. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm still on my uh, first cup of coffee here. Uh, well, good. So um, it's a fascinating story, and we'll get into it in a minute. But you know, your your first books, you've got outside nature, bird watching. How did you discover this World War II story, and what what you know, began the journey of writing the book. Sure. Uh, about 15 years ago, I was working on my first book, which was about competitive bird watching, of all things. They made a movie out of it with uh, Jack Black and Steve Martin and Owen Wilson. Well, when I was researching that bird book, I learned about a place called Attu, A-T-T-U. Unless you do crossword puzzles, you probably haven't heard of it. But Attu Island is the westernmost point of Alaska in the Aleutian Islands. And it's out there. It's so far out there, they actually curved the international date line around it to keep North America on the same calendar page. And when I was researching the history of North America, I learned that Japan, or when I was researching the history of Attu, I learned that Japan had invaded and conquered part of Alaska during World War II. I didn't know that. The first U.S. soil lost since the War of 1812, uh, the only ground battle of North America, or the only ground battle of World War II fought on North American soil. Didn't know that either, and I especially didn't know that the Battle of Attu was an especially uh, vicious fight. It had a casualty rate that was exceeded in the Pacific War only at Iwo Jima. Uh, still, as you mentioned at the outset, I'm a a journalist, uh, and I'm interested in the stories of people. I'm not a military historian. But when I learned that there were two men uh, who had fought each other in the Battle of Attu, one of a coal miner from Appalachia, an American war hero, and the second was an American trained surgeon from Hiroshima, and that they had fought each other, and that there had been the recovery of a diary, a war journal and that the two families had spent more than 40 years trying to find each other to seek peace and reconciliation after. Well, that was a, that was a human story that I could, uh, I could grasp and was really excited to get. And so it took quite a while for me to, to get this uh, story. Uh, I did two other books uh, in the meantime. And to get it, uh, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. National Archives in College Park, Maryland, and Elmendorf Air Force Base and windowless rooms in Anchorage, Alaska, and college libraries in Atlanta and Los Angeles and Oregon, and talk with many families all across the country. And uh, uh, best of all, even for me, uh, I actually got to camp on Attu Island, which has uh, been pretty much uninhabited for the past 10 years. Uh, it is just, it's Attu's out there. It's farther west than, than Fiji. It's about the same longitude as uh, New Zealand. Yeah, we'll show a map later, folks. We've got we've got Mark's images he supplied us, so we'll be showing a map and showing you some pictures later on. So yeah, I mean, it's sorry to interrupt there. It's it's yeah, I'm like you, and I am a military historian, and I knew little about the Battle of Attu, and it's one of those things I've done lots of shows where we discuss it with Jima or Normandy or Arnhem or Midway, and people have read stat loads of books about those subjects because there are stat loads of books about this sub. There aren't many about Attu at all, let alone anything as as personal and and you know, heartwarming and yet sad as well. We'll, we'll get into the story in a minute as your book. So it's, it's you know, it, it, for me, it wins on two counts. It's a, it's a readable account of the battle, which I didn't have, and it's a really great personal story. So win-win as far as I'm concerned. Well, thanks. There's, there's, there's actually kind of a reason why uh, a lot of people don't know about the Battle of Attu, because for both countries, for the United States and Japan, in, in a lot of ways, it was kind of a shameful chapter in the history of uh, both countries, but we can get to that later. But anyway, here, just to give you a flavor, here's the uh, here's the beginning of the book, and here's the uh, uh, here are some of the themes that I ended up writing. About. Laura Davis was confused. In the living room of her home stood a fidgety old man, but she did not know what the visitor wanted. He talked about his grown children. He talked about his Arizona retirement. 
And he talked on and on about his beloved orchids and all their beauty and their fragility and their rewards. Davis had little time for exotic flowers or idle chit chat. She was an intensive care nurse scrambling at home with five-year-old fraternal twins, her live-in elderly mom, and in an increasingly rocky marriage. She tried to be polite, but really, wasn't it time for this guy to go? Finally, it was. As Laura walked the man outside to his car, he paused and wheeled around. By the way, he told her, I'm the one who killed your father. Laura reeled. Was this some kind of a sick joke, by the way? What kind of talk was that? So casual, yet so devastating. With his black framed glasses and shock of white hair, the visitor looked like a lanky grandfather, not some demented prankster. He seemed nervous, too. His face was ashen and grim. Before Laura could ask a question, the man dropped into his driver's seat, checked his rearview mirror, and drove away. He left Laura so stunned she felt dizzy. She'd been through a lot in her life, crushing childhood poverty, a life-changing move from Japan to the United States, the birth of her beloved twins. But she'd always had one deep hole in her life. She had never met her father. He died when Laura was a baby, before she had babbled even her first word. The little she knew about her father came almost entirely from her mother, who wasn't saying much. Laura had been too busy raising her own family to spend time researching the past of a man who only existed as framed photographs on the wall of the family house. With a few brief words uttered in front of a house in Sherman Oaks, California, the lives of Laura Davis and her visitor were changed forever. Laura would spend the next year scrambling to uncover her family's past. The visitor would struggle to overcome his own past. They would learn about honor and courage, anger and forgiveness, the duty of a man to serve his country, even if the result was a pain that would not go away. He would become enmeshed in a military battle long forgotten, on a miserable island far from civilization, a place that claimed thousands of lives but ultimately yielded no prize for its conquerors. Davis and the visitor would discover the secrets that had ruined lives and the truths that had helped to heal them. He would find fathers who soared with joy and others who shouldered burdens that grew unbearable. They would learn about scars that could heal only through atonement. And at the center of all these revelations would be the diary. In his last 18 days on earth, when Laura's father was doomed and knew it, he had written a diary, his final farewell to the family he had just started and the daughter he had never met. That diary had been recovered by the stranger at Laura's door. It had been passed around to thousands of US servicemen. How the diary would change hands and change the hearts of so many who read it would be the greatest lesson of all to Laura. So that's how the start book starts. And you can appreciate, folks, when I read that opening bit in the book, that was it. I, I stormed through it uh, appropriately given the title. And I think two, two sittings or possibly three. And I have to tell you at the moment, I'm reading a hell of a lot of books for World War II TV because of the shows coming out. And some of them, big, thick, 600-page military histories take a little bit more wading through than yours, which just blitz through. I, I, I was hooked from the beginning. So um, not that I'm turning this into some kind of sycophantic author worship but i did really enjoy it so um as i said you could you've 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 prepared some fantastic powerpoint slides you could tell us who we're talking about and we're going to put it into the context of the battle of atu which as you say is a forgotten battle and or largely forgotten and i particularly like that point of uh, you just said there about the fact it had no real benefit it's it's not like normandy it's not like um a, a liberation where peace was re restored and that hope was it, it was it was a almost meaninglessly ca meaningless campaign but anyway we've got these images so i'll hand over to you when i've got questions from the audience so i want to jump in i will i will um i will, will do so so here here are american um heroes so explain who these two are sure here are the first two people uh dick laird and his wife rose now dick is uh dick grew up poor uh, really poor uh, so poor that, in fact, he was forced to drop out of school at age 14 and become an underground coal miner in Appalachia, one of the most impoverished regions of the U.S. Now, being a coal miner in the Great Depression in uh, Appalachia was not easy. Uh, Dick's friends were getting 
maimed. His neighbors were getting killed. Laird himself uh, had to narrowly escape from a bunch of injuries. And so he wanted a way out of this predestined life for him. And uh, what did he see that was his safe ticket out of poverty and, and life in the mines at age 16? Volunteering for the U.S. Army. Now, uh, Rose, the woman on the right here, uh, I'm really grateful to the two families in this book because they really opened their uh, their hearts, uh, but also their attics and their trunks and their photo albums to me. Uh, they really were so candid about so much of their lives. Now, I think that Rose and Dick would probably be the first to say that before they fell in love, uh, they fell in lust. Uh, they had a child out of wedlock, uh, which in the 1930s was uh, in the U.S. was was not an easy thing to do. But I think that uh, Dick uh, was also uh, kind of a boxer and a, and a drinker. Uh, Dick would be the first to say that uh, Rose and uh, their daughter uh, really helped him uh, kind of toe the line and give him a new outlook. So that's Dick Laird. Uh, the next, uh, and here are the people who really got me going on the story to start with. Uh, on the left is Nobuo Tatsuguchi, who uh, born and raised in Hiroshima, uh, Seventh-day Adventist, Christian, uh, kind of a minority of a minority in uh, his home uh, country, which is predominantly Shinto Buddhist. Uh, now, uh, Nobuo Tatsuguchi came to the United States for an education at a Seventh-day Adventist college in the Napa Valley of Northern California, uh, then went to medical school in Southern California. Uh, and when he came to California, he took on a Western name, uh, started going by the name Paul, Paul Nobuo Tatsuguchi. He fell in love with America. He loved the tall buildings, the skyscrapers, the ice cream, the, the open spaces, the, the, the wandering spirit. Uh, and he, he especially loved, I think, uh, the focus on the United States that uh, uh, it was okay to make mistakes. Uh, uh, his home country was preoccupied with avoiding shame. And uh, Paul could, in his surgical training at White Medical Center, uh, could uh, in, in in Los Angeles could uh, try all sorts of different things. He loved America so much that when his girlfriend came over from uh, Tokyo, he met her. Uh, he actually proposed marriage to her at Yosemite National Park in California. And then for their honeymoon, uh, they hopped on one of the first Greyhound buses and went on a bus tour from California all the way across the country to Niagara Falls, uh, New York. What more American thing can you do in that era than uh, honeymoon at Niagara Falls? Uh, when they returned from their uh, honeymoon, there was a telegram waiting for them saying that uh, Paul's parents, uh, while they were away on their honeymoon, uh, had died within a few days of each other in Japan. Uh, his brother had panicked and sold one of his sisters into a brothel in Manchuria. And so the newlyweds, uh, uh, Paul and Taeko, uh, get on a ship and rush back as fast as they can to their homeland of Japan to buy Paul's sister out of a brothel in Manchuria. Uh, when they are back in Japan collecting the money and trying to figure out how to buy a sister, Pearl Harbor happens. And uh, Paul, uh, as a Seventh-day Adventist, a committed pacifist, Paul is conscripted against his will to fight for Japan against the United States, the nation he loves. And so here's a picture of Paul in his Military uniform, as far as I can tell, he was the only surgeon uh, who was never granted officer rank. Uh, nobody trusted him. Uh, they thought that he had gone Western, uh, that he uh, had, was consorting with the enemy in the United States during his uh, life there. He spoke fluent English. Uh, he adopted many Western mannerisms, wore Western glasses. And uh, so what do you do with the guy you don't trust, but who you need? Japan was really short on medics. Well. <laughs> You send him to a place that nobody's ever heard of, uh, far away, where they figured that he can't do much damage, a place called Atu. Uh, now, Atu is out there. <laughs> you can uh, see from the uh, pointer there that uh, Paul has. It's about the same longitude as, uh, as New Zealand. Uh, now, uh, a crazy thing about Atu is that uh, it actually has some of the worst weather on Earth. I mean, it's at the confluence of the really cold seas from the, the Bering Sea to the north and the warmer currents from the Pacific. 
to the south. And when there's this mix of warm and cold, uh, you get this bizarre weather phenomenon called willowaws, which are these spontaneous hurricane force winds that rocket down from the volcanic uh, mountaintops, 3,000 foot mountains in Attu. They rocket down from there and zoom down to the to the shores and will knock you on your butt. It happened to me several times when I was uh, an Attu. Really, I think the only person who thinks that Attu is a good military target are people who have never been there. You know, maybe a general sitting in a comfortable office in Tokyo or Washington. But uh, in general, I, I think the general, you know, the, the generals in uh, uh, in Tokyo uh, looked at Attu and said this could be a stepping stone for uh, an assault on uh, the, the Pacific coast of uh, Canada, then down you know, to the Great Boeing plant in Seattle, in uh, the United States, then you know further down to San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, what they did not. Or think of, did not contend, or did not even consider was the weather. Uh, Attu is really kind of a miserable place. There's only, I believe, uh, eight or ten days a year total that are free of snow or ice or sleet or fog. Uh, it is, uh, it, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's the land of sideways snow. <laughs> Uh, so it's a crazy so, thing. Sorry to interrupt. What's so funny, Mark, is that we just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we did our, our week of preparations for D-Day and we talked about all the incredible you know, planning about weather and mind sweeping. And, and not that we're going to go into the detail of the Atu campaign particularly, but it is a case study of how not to prepare from both sides, either the Japanese or the the Americans of, 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 of a campaign. I mean, as you said, they completely misunderstood the weather, completely misunderstood the strategic importance of it. The only people who lived there had, had had to completely adapt to this completely weird, bizarre lifestyle of crappy weather. And, and you know, you can't just go there and we'll get into it later. But the American division they sent had spent ages training for desert warfare and then get sent to an island in the middle of the, you know, the, uh, it, it, these conditions. It's it's a I think that's why it hasn't attracted the military historians, because it's everything that kind of could have gone wrong in the planning did go wrong. And so we prefer to talk about the the. Uh, the, the the Normandies and the, the the other invasions that worked better because I think they they make us feel better about ourselves. But I I'm going down a rabbit hole there, and I'll, but I'll let you continue there. But yeah, the, the, we've got these images of the of the island there and and the people who lived there. But that time, and I'll hand back to Mark now. Well, here's here's the sum total of who was uh, living on that. It was about uh, 44 natives uh, uh, who had uh, sustenance uh, living. They would hope to get a bowhead whale or two. Uh, every year that would get them through the winter. Uh, they lived uh, in a lot of grass huts. Uh, there was a white uh, school teacher and her husband. And uh, so when the Japanese came with a garrison of about 2,000 men, uh, you know, they could have taken Atsu with a bullhorn. Uh, they didn't need guns, but, uh, but they did. And this was what they had uh, conquered. It was almost, I think, six months of the day after uh, Pearl Harbor. And there it is. Uh, uh, Japan raising the flag over Attu, the first U.S. territory lost since the War of 1812. You can see the natives uh, uh, huddling in the background. A really sad story of what happened to the natives. Eventually, they were shipped back to uh, Japan as uh, prisoners of war, uh, ended up uh, being assigned to Hokkaido. Uh, Japan was really an awful place to be during World War II. And uh, uh, frankly, I think only half the natives uh, ended up surviving between uh, uh, starvation and flu and uh, uh, and uh, natives never came back to live on their home island uh, after this. And so, uh, so there's, uh, there's that too. But of course, as we as we'll find out that the, the Americans wanted to take it back as a matter of, if nothing else, it's pride. It's the fact that a piece of American, American uh, land has been lost and it's part of the whole. It's not just a war of, of locations and strategic importance. It's a war of propaganda. It's a war of who's in control. And so a plan is and we're not going to go into the, the big. There's lots in the book, by the way, folks, that, that Mark does go into details about the planning and the, the, the changes of command and and what have you, and the planning and, and the, all that as well. But we're really talking about the two the two individuals tonight. But it is all in the book, should you want to do that. But, of course, the Americans plan this invasion. They plan on taking it back. And as we said, anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I've included a map there of the invasion. So we're talking about May 1943. So it's kind of midway through the Pacific campaign. 
Um, but this isn't really the Pacific campaign, but it's part of the, it's island hopping in the sense that it is an island that we have to take, but it doesn't really come into the, it's not the same as all the, uh, the, 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 the Saipan and Tarawas and things further south. It's, but it is, it is part of that general, general movement, I guess. Right. So there was a garrison of about 2000 uh, Japanese men, including uh, Paul Tatsuguchi, who came and uh, took uh, Atu. Uh, the United States, in one of the few good decisions that they made, uh, decided, uh, well, you want that to, fine, you, you have to have it through the winter. So they came back in uh, May, which in much of the world, maybe in Washington, D.C. or Tokyo, you know, that's springtime. Uh, and Atu, it is, uh, it, is, it is mud season. It is still uh, a really awful time. And so the United States uh, uh, came back in full force in, in May. Uh, you know, well over uh, 10,000 men and uh, began to mount this assault on, uh, on uh, Atu Island. Uh, and uh, the, the Japanese had actually prepared pretty well. Uh, they had spent time training as well as uh, Paul Tatsuguchi had spent time training on Hokkaido, which, uh, you know, I live in Colorado in the U.S. We're skiers. Uh, the, mentioning that northern Japanese island uh, sets your uh, it raises your heart if you are a skier. People uh, talk about using a snorkel to be able to uh, ski uh, there because there's so much snowfall. So in some ways, they were prepared for the elements. Uh, they were they were hunkered down. Uh, and so a year later, uh, as uh, Paul uh, really astutely mentioned, uh, there wasn't so much military strategic value take uh, on Atu, but there was propaganda value. And uh, the United States was determined to show that uh, you know, the, the, the events of Pearl Harbor, that that uh, uh, would not continue. And so Dick Laird and uh, U.S. troops uh, uh, were assigned to come back and, and recapture uh, Atu. Now, the crazy thing that uh, Paul mentioned at the outset was that Laird and his U.S. troops had actually been training for months in the Mojave Desert of California. They were supposed to fight Rommel. Uh, and the Nazis in the desert sands of North Africa, but the U.S. kind of in its arrogance uh, looked and said, well, there's only a, you know 2,000 men, 2,000 Japanese on this island that nobody's heard of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it'll just take three days for us to take this island back if we send our men, which they did. Uh, they sent U.S. troops with pretty much desert gear, uh, totally unprepared for Alaska, uh, especially uh, uh, in Alaska that is transitioning between winter to Sprint, where there was just unbelievable amounts of mud. Uh, the U.S., as you see here, was unable to get any mechanized equipment uh, inland. You know, everything became bogged down in, in axles. Uh, the Japanese were extremely shrewd. Here, maybe go to the to the next one. Uh, well, that's they, a bit of, there's a bit of footage there. I just I just did to show you the terrain, folks. Just a minute or so of the footage. It's actually there's some quite a bit of stuff on YouTube. If you want to search it for it yourselves, folks. But it's mostly that typical, with hindsight, not showing any of the bad stuff. It's kind of showing the victory. It's landing craft. It's aircraft flying over. The the footage, the the public release f films ended up being rather a sanitized, neatened version of things. But it does give you a bit of an idea of what we're talking about. When we're talking mountains, they are really are they are mountains, and the mud at the foot of them, and you know, the conditions, the temperatures. Yeah, hot in the day, freezing cold at night. Um, you know, you, you couldn't make it up, the, the, the awful conditions there. Well, and the way they described it, those are terrific uh, uh, pictures. Uh, you know, Atu, because it was at the confluence of the, the, the warm and the cold, it's almost always in fog. Soldiers talked about not being able to see the end of their the, the, the barrel of their guns or their rifles uh, because the fog was so dense. And so the Japanese were really shrewd. Uh, they sent up and fortified uh, higher parts of the island, and they would stay in the highlands uh, and remain right at the edge of the fog, and they would go up and down uh, based on where the, the fog line was to be able to conceal themselves. And Dick Laird and the Americans described, I mean, they were bogged down in the mud down below. They couldn't get equipment in. They couldn't get artillery in. You can see here they're trying to, to, to get uh, supplies or whatever in through deep snow. Meanwhile, the Japanese were above them shooting at them. Uh, from the club and 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 Laird and the Americans, they said uh, trying to fight back uh, uh, against the Japanese was like trying to shoot birds out of a cloud. Uh, you couldn't see the enemy. Uh, it's just next thing you know, your uh, your buddy 
uh, in combat was uh, shot from a bullet or shrapnel that nobody even knew uh, where it came from. And the U.S. couldn't even get supplies inland. You know, they had banked on uh, being able to uh, get uh, meals and everything. And at one point, Laird, uh, there's some more mud, uh, but at one point, Laird, uh, the, the U.S. soldiers were prosecuting a war and would, uh, he described uh, crawling on his belly to a creek where he caught a trout in his bare hands and he ate it. And that's how he survived while fighting the Japanese. The U.S. generals had told the troops that this would just be a three-day battle. Uh, three weeks later, uh, it still raged. Uh, you can see in this, uh, look at this photo. Uh, U.S., uh, this is uh, uh, traversing a ridge uh, called Fishhook Ridge. Uh, the U.S. men were wearing boots that were for the desert. They had no, it was they were smooth leather bottoms, fine in the desert, but if you're trying to cross a kular, uh, one slip and you're zooming down hundreds or thousands of feet uh, to your death. Now imagine crossing these steep you know, side hills like this uh, and having someone shoot at you. Uh, this is one reason why uh, the casualty rate was so high for uh, both the Americans and the Japanese. And to, they weren't just fighting each other, uh, they were fighting the elements, they were fighting Mother Nature as well. Another bit of footage here, folks. And yeah, and, and uh, Mark, you'll elaborate on this, I'm sure. But it's, as you say, it's, it's not just the, the enemy, it's the, the frostbite and, and trench foot, trench foot, particular problem. It reminded me reading your book. A little bit about reading about the Falkland Islands back in 1982. I know a completely different part of the world, but that same thing of kind of terrain. And if you've got the ill-fitting or ill ill-suited boots for that environment, the dampness, how quick. I mean, trench foot was something that was a massive problem in the First World War, of course. And but this is by 1943, the US Army is a is a kind of a mechanized beast of war. It's got this technology we talked about. We've talked about, you know, you've you're, you're in the middle of developing A weapons and this, that. And you're sending guys into combat with the wrong boots for the terrain. It's extraordinary. This was allowed to happen still, you know, in '43. It's uh, it is incredible. People who have never trained in snow, uh, in some yeah. cases, pe people who have never seen snow, but uh, much less uh, much less fought them. And that's that same footage of those people crossing these ridges. And you can see from a military point of view, the guys watching this who, who know that, you know, the Japanese who are on these high bits, they know exactly which route the Americans are going to pro approach. Them. They know where the valleys are, know where the gullies are, know which bits are going to be difficult to pass, know which bits aren't. And you say about the fog, they probably got their fields of fire and their lines of sight worked out where they can actually shoot. Because fog doesn't stop bullets. It only stops you seeing the enemy. But if the Japanese know where the Americans are going to be appearing, you from you're, you're going to be caught in a in, in in fire and you can't even shoot back at it i mean just miserable miserable conditions and i urge people to read more about this campaign because it's it's absolutely um incredible what what they the seventh division endured there right to get supplies inland uh, they would form human conveyor belts uh, to get wounded soldiers out they had to do that there was really no mechanized way to, to remove them and people were just tired uh, you know this is just I think this photo is just three or four days in uh, when these troops had been told that uh, you'd be done. You know, you'd be heroes. You would have taken the island back. And there you can see that uh, that fog line. Uh, imagine the Japanese uh, uh, up there and uh, and shooting down on you from, uh, from up there. Uh, as Paul mentioned, trench foot, uh, you know, that's something that goes back to the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, really no reason why generals shouldn't have anticipated it, but uh, they didn't. And so whenever they could, you see them here, uh, they would try to massage each other's feet. Uh, hundreds, hundreds of soldiers lost uh, toes, lost fingers, lost feet uh, to frostbite and to uh, trench foot. You know, many, many amputations. Uh, in some ways, you know, the casualty rate in this war was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, because it was so hard to, to extract wounded uh, soldiers. It, it, it took so many men to haul out injured uh, uh, soldiers that uh, that was a huge sap on uh, U.S. forces as well. You know, I think a real strategic advantage that uh, uh, the Japanese took advantage of. And of course, in your research for the book, Mark, I mean, because of this this diary, which I'm, I know you'll get on to and explain how it came to be, 
you have at least one Japanese point of view, because that's the thing when you get to some of these island campaigns is that the number of Japanese survivors was almost negligible, a lot of these places. So there's virtually nothing surviving from anybody Japanese who was there. And if they, But in this case, you've got a guy writing a diary. You've got a guy writing th these notes down. So almost uniquely, we have some idea of the misery, because the Japanese weren't much better off than the Americans in terms of the climate. They a little bit better suited in terms of, of 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 clothing because they'd been there for months. But their problem was supplies. That Although the Americans couldn't get the supplies there, at least there were American supplies to be brought ashore eventually. The Japanese, of course, by this point, they are completely isolated. There's no help coming. They're not going to get anywhere. So they've got to resort to whatever they've got left. So give us an idea of, about about how, 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 how Paul um, explains what was going on from the Japanese point of view. Sure, you're exactly right. Uh, it's really, in many ways, a shameful, a really shameful chapter of Japanese history. Uh, that country abandoned 2,000 men. Uh, they were on an island with uh, no reinforcements, no ammunition, no food coming. Uh, Paul Tatsuguchi, the uh, surgeon I write about, uh, during this time started uh, writing a diary, and uh, it is harrowing. Uh, he describes, you know, performing surgeries while ducking from shrapnel. Uh, he does an amputation while in a cave, uh, and uh, his colleague, a surgeon next to him, is is hit and killed. Uh, he describes uh, uh, just uh, what it's like to be on the the receiving end of, you know, what at that time was the most ferocious fighting force uh, in the history of the planet, and. Uh, Tatsuguchi is torn. Uh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. He is a pacifist. He doesn't want to be in war. Uh, you know, the, the, the only way that he was able to justify it in his own mind was that uh, he believed that he was going to war to heal as a surgeon rather than to, uh, to fight. Uh, but here's a guy who's uh, distrusted by his colleagues because he speaks fluent English. Uh, he lived in America. You know, Japan was such an isolated, uh, inward-looking country uh, and he's on this island getting shelled not just daily but hourly uh, and uh, he writes in kind of this matter of fact uh, style uh, just the facts of this uh, of this diary so, and, and what's extraordinary as well is that you know we, we you know he is he is a properly trained surgeon trained in the USA but he's not really yes. As you say, he's not been given the rank. He's not really been given that role. So he's actually really just serving as a medic, although he can do more than that. And this, this is this. You, when you read it, you can only feel the isolation he feels. There's the physical isolation of being on an island a long, long way from his home and his and his family. But there's also the isolation of being clearly the oddball within his own unit. You know, as you say, he's the Westernized. He's not. He's Christian rather than you know. Shinta, he's right. he's. He, he's he's not got the role, the rank that should go with his skill set. So he's completely isolated. And I think also a lot of people watching this show, we're, we're used to the, the narrative of the Japanese, the enemy being cruel and vicious and horrible. And, and of course, that is a, a very common theme when we're talking about the Japanese in World War II. But it would be a mistake of us to group everybody into that category. That is like not all Germans are Nazis. It's it's important to read another side of things. And there are other Japanese people serving who are humane, who ha who do, who are looking beyond this and who are conflicted. And that's what you know I found particularly revealing you know re rewarding about reading your book is 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 hearing that other side of 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 the Japanese military because we are kind of fed that one view. So when when I'm just asking you a question about the research, you said you didn't know much about Atu, but clearly. As an American, you were aware of the Japanese being the "quote unquote" baddies in World War II. So, did 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 you you obviously must have learned a lot about about your own understanding of what you thought perceived the Japanese to be by by studying this one case? Yes, I did. Uh, so much of what you said is really uh, perceptive. Uh, you know, when I uh, when I went into this project, uh, I always knew that it was. Uh, the politicians who declare war, and it's the generals who do the strategy of war. Uh, but ultimately, it's people, people like uh, like you and me, who uh, who actually fight the war, and especially who have to live with the aftermath. And 
not just the soldiers, but their families as well. And so here's Paul's uh, diary. So what happens is after three weeks of uh, shelling, the U.S. force of 2000 uh, has been reduced to maybe 500 survivors. Uh, they've got no ammo. Uh, they've got no food. They've got no hope. And so their commander gathers them together after three weeks and says, this is it. We've got to do something to change the course of this battle. And so uh, they organize one of the biggest bonsai attacks of World War II. Now, Dick Laird is in his tent on the side of the mountain, and here's some movement uh, up the slope. And he uh, looks up and sees that uh, a group of about eight Japanese soldiers has captured a key American mortar, and they are spinning around the opposite direction so that the American mortar no longer faces the Japanese, but the Japanese soldiers are turning that mortar back on the American troops themselves. Laird realizes that this could change the course of the battle. And so what he does is he pulls out a grenade, he follows his training, waits a second, hurls it, boom, he goes up follows and realizes that not all eight soldiers have been killed. Laird finishes that. Uh, and he does exactly what his training tells him to. Uh, Laird is desperate for any kind of military intelligence. The U.S. had not anticipated uh, this tenacious of a fight, this difficult of a fight. And so Laird uh, starts looking for anything that can provide U.S. troops with any kind of hint of what the Japanese are up to. And what he finds uh, first is an address book with many names written in English in California. He's, this is the address book of Paul Tatsuguchi and the names of his uh, med school classmates. And then Laird finds a sheet hand scrawled in Japanese. Laird really hopes this might be the key piece of military intelligence that will give away the Japanese strategy. Uh, he sends that uh, uh, he sends that Japanese uh, text to the back lines to be translated. Uh, and what comes back in translation is something that is far more powerful than military intelligence. Uh, what comes back is that uh, he has found the diary of Paul Nabuo Tatsuguchi. And for Laird and many of his fellow soldiers, uh, this is devastating. All their training had been that the Japanese were uh, heartless savage, uh, killing machines. And yet, here's a man who, by his own words, shows that uh, he really missed his wife. Uh, he loved his children. Uh, he had no more connection to Alaska than Dick Laird did. There was really no reason for either man to be fighting there. And these are, these are this is Paul's wife and uh, two daughters, and Laird course himself had a wife and a daughter back home in the states and Laird is racked. He's especially racked by this fear that he has killed an American. And so Laird, for his actions on Attu for uh, stopping that uh, mortar takeover, uh, Laird actually is granted the Silver Star, the third highest honor uh, in the U.S. Army uh, for valor. He has done what his country has asked and more. Uh, and yet, Laird can't sleep. He's haunted by nightmares. Uh, after Atsu, Laird goes on and uh, goes through a who's who list of some of the ugliest campaigns of the Pacific Quadrant, Philippines, uh, Okinawa. Finally, after Okinawa, which, is, as your viewers know, is an especially awful uh, battle, uh, Laird had accumulated enough beachheads, uh, enough combat, in some ways they couldn't believe he was still alive. And they said, okay, you can, you can go home. So they, they let him home, and Dick Laird uh, goes home a war hero and ends up building uh, a classic American life. He's a blue-collar guy, uh, does uh, uh, raises a family. Uh, he's an asbestos worker. Uh, does uh, as best as work on uh, a lot of uh, power plants around the American Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, and yet he can't sleep. Laird can't sleep. Here's uh, 
this is something people sometimes ask me why I write nonfiction instead of fiction. This is the kind of thing that uh, uh, if I put this in fiction, nobody would believe me. <laughs> uh, on the battlefield, uh, one thing was recovered was this medical satchel, which uh, U.S. soldiers brought back to their own surgeons. And uh, there was a guy, Dr. Lawrence Whitaker, who looked inside. And inside this medical satchel uh, was a copy of the classic American surgical manual, Gray's Anatomy. It's what so many doctors have been trained on. Dr. Lawrence Whitaker opens up Gray's Anatomy, and he looks at the name that was signed to this book in English that was recovered from a Japanese troop. And it was Paul Tatsuguchi, who was his classmate at Loma Linda University in Southern California. And so Whitaker leaves his tent surgical bay on Attu and goes out to the battlefield where he identifies the body of his former med school classmate, Paul Tatsuguchi. It's, it's funny you should say that about fiction being less weird than nonfiction. It's come up so many times before on World War II TV with Damien Lewis writing about the SAS in Italy and these other operations. Now you couldn't make up in it. it we had a we did a big th uh, discussion about historical fiction and why people bother to making making stuff up when a bit of search and you can find these absolutely amazing stories. You never need to make anything up. And another thing that occurred to me is 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 when I was reading your book is that the the seeds for the perfect storm because this diary you know that was found that it got copied and translated multiple times and all sorts of gis and navy personnel ended up with copies of this almost like pirate copies like a like pirate copies of a of a kind of a, a rare gig by a band and i found that fascinating because i think the seeds of that were because people were in that really despondent state in Atta. It wasn't like some other campaigns where there was a sense of victory. I think they were all grumpy anyway, the Americans. So there was no sense of victory. There was a lots of probably bitterness about their commanding officers. And why are we sent here? Why have we got the same boot, the wrong boots, all that. And I think into that kind of perfect storm, a diary written from an enemy soldier found roots there that maybe wouldn't have happened had they found this diary on another island. I don't think maybe it would have, the magic would have been there. It had to be this situation where people are in that environment to, to want to hear the enemy's side. I mean, that, that's what, that was my takeaway reading it, that there was something kind of um, almost fatalistic about this happening, that fate had interceded to kind of make this, this situation come about, which is just amazing. But so the story continues. We've got more to go there. I'll, I'll let you come in, introduce the next couple of slides and what have you. So, um, and we got some footage again of this is uh, this is the aftermath. This is dealing with some of the recovery of the dead and the and the, the, the misery and the, it wasn't it was not a very nice ending to the camera. Nineteen days uh, of fighting, five hundred and what my my figures here: five hundred and forty nine American soldiers killed, one thousand one hundred and forty eight wounded, and more than two thousand incapacitated by non non combat reasons. So trench foot things, and then as a Jap and as you said, the Japanese garrison. Wiped out except for two, was it two or three survivors or something? Well, there were Japanese who uh, maybe, uh, uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple dozen. But in general, there were soldiers who were wounded, uh, Japanese soldiers who were wounded enough that they, uh, their, their training had been to kill themselves. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was shameful, uh, the height of shame or the depth of shame uh, to be captured alive. And so Japanese soldiers had no training about that. And U.S. soldiers described... Uh, uh, how unexpected it was for them to capture some of the few POWs, the few Japanese POWs, and they would tell them everything they knew because they had no training of what you were supposed to do when you were captured. Uh, they were not supposed to be captured. And almost to a man, the, the few dozen uh, Japanese uh, POWs uh, asked not to be returned home to Japan. They had brought much shame on their family. And so uh, many, many uh, U.S. killed, I mean, Japanese garrison of 2,000 men uh, abandoned by their country. Uh, almost everyone ended up, you know, almost everyone was killed. And, ended up dead. Yeah. and, and Laird, uh, you know, Laird comes back to the U.S. and just has these awful nightmares. Uh, at night, he wakes up screaming. Uh, his you know, beloved wife, Rose, is always, you know, Dick, wake up, wake up, wake up. Uh, you know, these days, I guess we, we call it PTSD, uh, back then it was shell shock, you know, but that just meant, ah, you know, suck it up and, and get back out there. It wasn't really fully understood. It definitely wasn't sympathized. And, uh, 
so Laird went on and you know, they, 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 they had a family, a number of daughters. Uh, he had a, a, a good career uh, building things across the American Southwest. And, uh, but he can't sleep. He can't sleep. You know, he won this great honor, this military, or was awarded this, this military medal from the U.S. He can't sleep. And finally, Rose just said, you know, you've, you've got to do something about this. You can't. I mean, in, in, in some ways, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's a man in his 60s and his 70s, and he's haunted by what happened uh, 50 years prior uh, when he was a young man. Uh, and so uh, he went searching. And uh, one thing with uh, uh, a family named Tatsuguchi is that it's an uncommon name. And he was able to actually track down Laura Tatsuguchi, and that is how I opened the book uh, in the beginning section that I uh, read. Now, Laura, when Dick Laird showed up, she was just taken aback. I mean, she had never met her dad. Uh, uh, her mom was uh, mostly, you know, we've got a new life. We're going to try to to put that behind us. Uh, but what Laura realized is that um, she'd always heard how her father died. Uh, but she never really knew how he had lived. And so Laura herself uh, became determined to go and learn about who her father was. And she spent uh, years uh, running down her, uh, Laura spent years running down her father's med school classmates until finally she worked up the courage to try to meet Dick Laird himself. And they did. And she took him out to lunch in Tucson and was really scared about this. You know, I'm going to take out to lunch the man who killed my father. What am I doing? And they did. They went out to lunch. It was really awkward. Laird talked about what it was like to fight in that too. Laura talked about what she learned about her father's life she had never known. And Laura went home and she realized that when she was at home, that Dick Laird was haunted. He was haunted and his life was still defined all these years later by what he had done on the island where they had heard of in the middle of the Pacific. So Laura sat down and wrote one of the most, to me, moving and eloquent letters I've ever read from the heart. And she absolved Dick Laird. She granted him peace. And atonement. And Laird got that letter and he read it and he cried. And that night, for the first time in more than 40 years, Laird slept without nightmares. And I like to look at this picture that you put up. You know, the United States today is such a divided country. Uh, we've been through it with Trump, uh, we've been at each other for quite a while. And I look at this picture, and I said, what do these two yeah, people well, have in There common? we go. And an internet surge there, maybe at a storm yeah. outside. No, I just, I look at this picture and say, what do these two people have in common? This man killed this woman's father. He's got his arm around her. If they can figure it out, if they can figure out how to grant peace and atonement, if they can be human, and I think there's more hope for the rest of us. And I just think that we, Americans at least, as a country, we can do better. I love this story because these are two people who did not seek headlines. They did not seek money. They did not seek publicity. Uh, they were just ordinary people uh, who sought each other out and gave each other what they needed to go on. And, uh, you know, Laura's mother would tell her that if you become a vessel of hate and carry it with you, it'll corrode you. It'll do you in. And so Laura was really pretty, uh, she said it was hard to do, but she never had any doubts that she did the right thing. And the crazy thing is, for you, they actually kind of became friends afterward. They would send each other letters, Christmas cards every year. And that's really you know, where it hit home that you know, we can talk on a World War II channel uh, about the great campaigns. But yeah. uh, ultimately, it's the Tatsuguchi and the Lairds uh, who do the work.
you know, well, in indeed, yeah, this. and you know, the, the the people were just sort of stunned into silence there. The comments coming in saying, "What an amazing story!" And you know, it's that kind of we kind of caught them with the beginning, and then we went into the military strategy of Atu, and then you kind of hit them with this this amazing ending there. And I think that's how I felt when I read it as well, of course. And it's come up a lot on World War Two TV. Yes, we like discussing the strategy. We like talking about the improvements in technology, but it also does come down to people. We've talked about rec reconciliation. We've talked about friendships after the war. It's come up a lot, and and um, it's important to never, to never, as you said there, forget that the ability we have to discuss whether or not a general failed in a certain campaign on a certain day is brought to us by the people who came back and endured such awful things on both sides and came back with so much mental baggage. And tomorrow, folks, we've got two shows. The second one, Dr. Um, uh, Lee Mandel, so U.S. Navy physicians, are talking about PTSD and how we identified it. And, you know, those of us of a certain age watching this, we all know those veterans we knew when we were young who we, they didn't even know what it was that was wrong with them. or And wrong is not the right word. They didn't know what it was they're experiencing. Now we throw the label PTSD at it and we have we have something we can at least kind of hook you know, as a coat hanger term. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. But back in the day, these guys had no idea that what they were going through, millions others were going through a variation of it. And that's what's so important. And not just the, the people who served. The children, uh, Laura's story as well, you're losing a parent and the conflict of being, and, and there's a whole ra rabbit hole of Japanese Americans and we've done shows about the 442nd Regimental Combat Team and internment, there's lots and lots of side stories there that we go into as well, but um, an amazing person to story. We've got a few more um, images to go through and we'll, we'll let you finish off. So you, you have been there and you, so what was it? Did, when you went there, had you finished the book or was it during the process of writing the book? Yes, it was after I had written the book and I went with uh, an American uh, television news show called 60 Minutes, which is a big, it's kind of a premier uh, uh, television news show. And the crazy thing was, uh, as I mentioned, nobody had lived on Attu for 10 years. Uh, nobody had landed a plane on Attu for at least two years. Uh, it's it's awful. Here, here's here's this, this picture here. This is the place where Dick Laird killed uh, Paul Tatsuguchi, the shoulder here on the left. The difference is that you can see. But when we were on Atu, it was a crazy thing. It was one of the eight total uh, days out of the year when there was no fog. It was unbelievable the luck that we had in September. But we had to, you know, we camped on Atu. There's no roads. There's no electricity. Uh, I think the nearest civilian population is 500 miles away, 500 miles away. There's a peace memorial that uh, the U.S. let uh, the Japanese government build on Attu. Still uh, quite a bit of controversy. Actually, the first peace memorial made of titanium went up there, and in classic Attu fashion, uh, it was destroyed by the weather, I think, within a year or two. And so this was a uh, replacement. But when we were on Attu, you know, we're, you're just, you're out there. I mean, I, I, we camped through Willowaz. I actually brought... Uh, we brought tents uh, that was like Everest, Mount Everest quality base camp stuff. You know, one night uh, I was in, you know, my mountain hardware tent. That's it's the classic tent for, for Mount Everest. And uh, the Willowaz came in and I'm laying on my belly and the, the tents flatten it down to my to my navel. And I'm curled in the fetal position. It really did sound like the freight train or worse. Uh, and then it, it was, and then it was like 20 people were standing around the tent with, you know, 10 gallon buckets, dumping water, dumping water, dump, and it just, it lifted, you know, I, Attu is a really hard place to be in, uh, in peacetime. I can't imagine being there when people, when you're stuck in the mud, stuck in the snow, losing feeling in your toes and, uh, and people are shooting at you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have to say, normally when I read a book about a battlefield, at least a part of me wants to go there. Didn't get that feeling reading your book. It was like, no, oh. I'm, I'm quite happy just reading the book. Thanks. Well, Thank the crazy you. thing here, you could you could go back a picture or two back on uh, back on Atu, but it's uh, you know, I mean, look, the thing is, when you get <laughs> when you only get eight sunny days of the year, when you do get sun, I mean, look at that place. Look at how lush that is. Uh, it, it looks like it looks like uh, uh, a tropical Pacific uh, island, Kauai, or you know, the North Shore of Kauai, or something like that. It's just that these are just almost, in some ways, almost unprecedented views. You never get to see how how green and and, and lush it is. We were walking around Atu, uh, and uh, you know the salmon are still running up uh, 
uh, creeks. Uh, you know, so many people. Uh, in some way, it was. Uh, I mean, so many people died for really no point. Natu, uh, but what a place! You know, when when yeah, when it was and that kind of brings us full circle, you know, that in the sense that, yeah, there is this unmilitary reason for taking the iron. The, the lives lost there, you kind of can't put them in this, well, it made the world a better place, although it did, gen of course, generally it did. When, you know, us, the Allies winning the war made the world a better place. But this probably didn't add much to it, but it's part of that pack package. We can't discount the lives lost there. But this incredible story of of reconciliation, this incredible story of two people from two sides that 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 found this peace, and as you said, they're so so um, appropriate given what we're going through. You know, again, it's come up on shows recently the the division between everybody right now, and you know, I've been in Normandy, I've seen German veterans hugging American veterans, I, and the same British veterans meeting German veterans. You think. If those guys can find the mental strength and the, the the spirit of forgiveness to embrace, then the rest of us just need to heed their advice and put away our, you know, our silliness and bitterness and just embrace the fact and celebrate our similarities, not always um, talk about our differences. But we start the, we, right at the beginning. You talked about your your you know there's a, there's a Hollywood film about your other book, Steve Martin Jack. But, When's the movie happening of this? I mean, come on! It's a, why I can't believe you haven't got, you know, companies lining up outside your door, camping in tents, waiting to get the rights of you. Is it? Is it going to happen? Do you reckon? We'll see. You know, it's uh, it, it it it's a it's a tough one to make because it spans so many years. Uh, it's also in difficult locations. <laughs> it's not a. Uh, uh, it's it's not it can't be done though on a sound screen. Um, that's true. That's a complicated so, one. And and one question that came in, um, a good one there from Rania. Um, is there a grave for Paul, our Japanese medic, or is is he is is there anywhere where they the family could visit? Or I guess is just a mass grave. Is that all there is? Right. There's a mass grave for Japanese troops that remains on Attu. There's been some talk in Japan of uh, uh, you know, uh, moving remains back to. Uh, Japan, but for now they remain there. All U.S. soldiers uh, have been moved off the island yeah. uh, to either their hometowns or to military cemeteries in different places. So, uh, but ultimately, that's kind of a, you know, if, if, if there are some big lessons here to me, as you mentioned, there is uh, that, that humans are capable of incredible courage, uh, incredible strength. Uh, but sometimes the biggest lesson of all comes through peace and atonement and, uh, yeah. and forgiveness. Absolutely. Well, we'll wrap things up there. I'll just say to the folks what we were coming up, and I'll say back and uh, come say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, uh, again, I say it again. Just don't don't argue with me. Just go and get the book, paperback, hardback, whatever you fancy. It's just a brilliant read. There's a couple of people watching who've just finished reading it. Tony in the Philippines has already read it. So, yeah, if you haven't read it, just go and get it. Two shows tomorrow, five o'clock UK time. We've got Reg Jans talking about the aid stations in Baston in, in, the, in the winter of 44. Then at 7 p.m. UK time, so same time as tonight's show, Lee Mandel, as I say, talking about PTSD. Don't forget, check out the link below to, to, to Mark's website. You can find a link to buy Mark's book in the description below. Check me out on Patreon. Check him out on Twitter, social media. There's lots of interviews with Mark on, on uh, YouTube beyond my ones. There's other things you can find out there. But right now, it remains me to say thank you very much for joining us from Denver. And um, when when you write another World War II bestseller, will you come back and talk about that as well? I'd love to. It's really uh, it's really wonderful to talk to somebody who's so uh, perceptive and really knowledgeable about the subject. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. And as for that, it's time to go now because all the Brits watching this show, it is the England game starting soon and the Scotland game starting soon. So I have cle cleverly and carefully finished the show on schedule tonight, which is perfect, a, a first for World War II TV. So again, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Thank you for your comments in the sidebar there. I'll go back and read some of them later. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. And I really hope that there's that there's a movie about this, or at least a a, a special or something, or uh, because it, it it deserves a wider audience. If not, in the meantime, just get the book and read it. So thank you everybody for watching. I will see you all again tomorrow for two talks. So thank you, Mark. Thank you everybody. I'll see you again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, Thanks so much. <laughs>